Good morning, and welcome to New Hope Community Church, and happy Memorial Day weekend. And we bless you this morning as we began to go into this service, and we're going to be speaking on the book of Nehemiah. We welcome you in this presence with us as the Holy Ghost just come in and sweep us away. So God bless you this morning, and uh, be a part of the service. Invite other people to the service as well. Let's start off with a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. We pray your blessings upon this service. You'll touch hearts and souls. Those who are far and near, may your blessings be upon them. And Father, may your blessings be upon this word as we know it will in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start now with the scripture in the book of Nehemiah. Now, the scripture says in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5. And the scripture goes on to say, And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those you love, who, uh, for those who love you and observe you, your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. What a prayer, isn't it? What a prayer. He is confessing not only his sins for his children, but for himself and for his fathers as well. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the audience which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out of the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your, to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Lord, we pray you will bless your word this morning. Again, give us listening ears and attentive hearts to receive your word. Father, these things we ask in Jesus' name. When we look at the book of Nehemiah, number one, it's only 13 small chapters in this book. Nehemiah was neither a priest, nor a prophet. Nehemiah, my friend, was a cupbearer. You know, a cupbearer, here's what a cupbearer's responsibility. As a raw cupbearer, not just any cupbearer, but Nehemiah's responsibility was to make sure that he tasted and, 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 and sampled every single drink that came to the king before he drank it. In other words, if there was poison inside of the drink for somebody to kill the king, he was his bodyguard and he was going to die for the king. He escorted the king every single day to his meal. And before he had his meal, he took the cup and he drank it and said, I would drink this cup because I know I'm responsible whether the king lives or dies. I don't know about you, but that's a tremendous amount of responsibility for anyone. But because Nehemiah was so faithful, neither prophet nor priest, just a cupbearer, there was two things that distinguished Nehemiah from anyone else. Nehemiah not only was a cupbearer, not only was he faithful, not only was he loyal to the king, but Nehemiah knew how to pray. 
Not only did he know how to pray, Nehemiah had visions and he knew he would be a doer. Just a simple man that God used in an incredible way. Now, I don't know about you, but let's just place this right here as an example. If you were in a high position and perhaps always in a position whereby somebody is trying to take you down, much like the President of the United States, you have to have bodyguards. You have to have people that are surrounding you to keep from killing you or executing you or assassinating you. And so this is what the king's responsibility to Nehemiah, Nehemiah's responsibility to the king was, to make sure that there was no poison in his drink nor his food. But he was the cupbearer for the king, the royal cupbearer. Nehemiah's name means Jehovah's Conference. Jehovah Conference. In other words, God Conference Nehemiah. No matter what, unlike Jeremiah, he was called the weeping prophet, Nehemiah was just a cup bearer. Now sometimes we, un we need to understand the concept that you may feel so small and insignificant in what you are doing. But you don't know where God has you right now for this particular reason and place in your life. You don't know the significance and the responsibility that God has placed you on your job for such a time as this for somebody else's life to be radically changed based on your presence. And sometimes we ignore those activities that are taking place in our lives and how the Holy Spirit is moving around. Because Nehemiah was the cupbearer for the king, he also won favor with the king because the king felt obligated that he owed it Nehemiah his life. Obviously, that probably was some close calls, I'm sure it was, that people tried to take near, uh, the king out, but Nehemiah had, had already sampled the drinks, whether it was wine, whether it was water, whether any type of beverages it was, Nehemiah was there to protect the king. So Nehemiah had this idea as he prayed unto the Lord. He knew that Jerusalem was in ruins. The walls had been fallen and had continued to be fallen. There was immorality, there was devastation, they were in exile, and Babylon had taken Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah had this idea to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. Now, I'm going somewhere with this, so follow me. This is not a boring story. It is it's actually every story, if you read the Bible, every story, to me, it's like watching the Temple of the Doom with Harrison Ford. You know, I mean, it's, it's just one excitement after another. If you remember, and I love movies like that, if, if you remember the Gladiator and they were going out to kind of a, a violent movie to say the least, but you remember he was getting ready to go out and fight and then they, he had won, uh, uh, Russell Crowe had won the respect of all the men as a great warrior. So when they got ready to feed him, and give him drink, the other guy, the strong guy, took the drink from him and began to sip it to make sure that they were not going to poison the main warrior in the group. It's called honor. It's called remembrance. It's called memorial. It's called to honor and respect. You imagine what Jesus did on the cross for you and I when he had to no longer take the cross, but he had to bear the cross at the same time for the remission of our sins. We don't get the gist of that until we stop and look at it that somebody went to the cross for you and me. Let's get back to Nehemiah because it has some of the same content within this. Nehemiah put his name on the line, but because he won favor with the king, he asked the king a favor. He felt compelled to go back to Jerusalem. 
So he asked the king for a leave of absence. The Bible doesn't really tell us how long, but it was some years, perhaps months or years, before he actually went back to the king after he rebuilt the walls. Now let's stop and think about it. He goes back and he pulls in before he leaves the king. He tells the king just right here, I'm going to need these type of materials. I'm going to need these. I'm going to need this. I'm going to need that. He wins favor. King sends out sort of a decree to all the people in that region and, this, and tell them that, listen, Nehemiah is coming here and he's going to build this wall. He's going to build that wall. He's going to build this all around Jerusalem. And as he's building these walls, he's telling these individuals that they need to come together and support him based on that. But how many of you know anytime you're getting ready to do something good, the devil's going to stick his face inside of it? Have you ever tried to make some grounds, uh, maybe tried to buy something, and there's always some chaos that comes with it? You ever tried to buy a house and you're thinking that you're going to get in it and you think you're going to get in there a lot quicker? Or you're trying to do a project on a home? Did you know that number one criteria for people getting divorces and separation is when they began to remodel their home? Yeah, they can get through anything. But the remodification of a home is one of the major crises that causes confusion and disdain with couples and families because they are not used to such uproar. And when they are in the house and the construction is going on, it causes a tremendous amount of stress. They have to go to work. They have to work around the construction. They have to deal with their children and everybody's complaining. They got dust and dirt and all the other materials that's inside of that. You make somebody want to hurt somebody. I know because I have done that a time or two, but my wife was here. We were going to a project and the next thing you know, it would be chaotic. But God in his infinite wisdom and mercy help us through that ordeal. The same thing that happens with Nehemiah. He goes through and now there's a coup that is forming thinking that Nehemiah is actually going to build the walls based on the fact that he's trying to form a coup to take over the king to be the king of Jerusalem. That was not his idea. He saw the corruption. He saw the, the, the struggleness. He saw the, the immorality that was taking place in Jerusalem. But more than anything, he wanted to rebuild the walls. Why to build the walls? To protect Jerusalem from falling again by his enemies. Nehemiah knew something. He got permission, and, and that's what the, the thing that sets him apart again. He was a prayer warrior. He was a man who knew how to pray. In fact, that's three or four times that Nehemiah says this right here. Remember me, O oh God, for good. You know what he's saying? Remember me for the good that I have done. Remember me for the good I have done. The man knew how to pray. The man knew that he was going to go through opposition. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You do not get through this life in Christianity without some type of opposition. I've seen, listen, I've been around pastors, including myself, who have gone through building projects, especially with churches. And I want to tell you, the enemy does everything to create chaos when you're going through building projects. He'll bring every devil from the face of hell to destroy, to, to bring destruction to you in any kind of way, to discourage you, to try to push you by the wayside. But I want to tell you something. You know that God is in it because when God is in it, he's going to prevail. That's why he said, upon this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. That same thing applies to your life. You are that rock in your Christian walk with Jesus. Upon the rock which God has made you, I build that church inside of you and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. You must believe the word of God for what it stands for and you will never be discouraged. That's why when we look at this right here and he begins to talk about these things, he's seeing some things that other people can't see. Listen, when God is bringing you through a journey, folks, you're going to see some things that other people can't see. 
if you are praying and you're seeking the face of God. You're going to do some other things that other people can't do. You're going to hear things that other people can't hear. You're going to feel the presence of God that other people can't because they aren't in that place that you are in. But you got to trust God. That's why he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. If you look at chapter 5, verse uh, 19, and he says it again in the book of Nehemiah, he said, Remember me, O God, for good, according to all I have done for this people. Because Nehemiah was a righteous man. And he can say that. You see, that, you, isn't it a wonderful thing the scripture tells us to come boldly before the throne of God that we may obtain his mercy and find grace in the time of need? To come boldly. In other words, God gives you and I permission to come boldly before his throne that we may obtain his mercy and find grace in the time of need. I don't know about you, but that just excites me almost out of my skin that I can come boldly before the throne of God. That's why we can't let the enemy come along and put these little uh, sounding bugs in our ears to discourage us from serving the resurrected Christ. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he'll do for one, he'll do for another. But God is no respect of persons. In other words, the closer you draw nigh to him, the closer he will draw nigh to you. Amen. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? Look at this. When Nehemiah's enemies came up against him, he prayed and he prevailed. Then his enemies concluded that this work was done by God. You know, it's an amazing thing. When the work is finished and, and nobody's around and you done gone through any, everything, then the, then the devils will come back and say, yeah, it was of God. I can see, yeah, I can, I can see now. Yeah, but where were you when I was going? This is why, folks, this is why we need to understand. You see, people, they, they see your glory, but they don't understand your story. They don't realize what you have to sacrifice sometimes. And we don't like to use the word sacrifice as much. We can't compare that with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what he has done for our lives and continue to do for that. But we need to be grateful for the life that we have and for what he has done. But we must always remember that everything that we hear are here on the face of this earth is because somebody has paid a price. Jesus has paid a price, my friend. And then they knew God's work, that God works through faithful people. And for the joy of the Lord is our strength. God works through faithfulness. You see, there's a time to pray and a time to do. And there's a time to do and, can, and a time to pray. In other words, you got to do both of them because faith without works is dead. You see, it's not going to happen just wishing things would take place. You, the faith comes into fact when you say, Lord, I trust in you. Now I'm going to get busy and get it done. And I know as I trust in you through faith, you will walk with me and the work will get done by your grace and your mercy, no matter what it is. Now, most of you here perhaps have worked or, or have a job or a career, you didn't just, somebody didn't just call you in and say, hey, uh, do you want to work? No, you have to go seek for that job. And then you got to go to the job and then you have to produce. I'm always, I'm always thinking about these great athletes, you know, because if they don't perform, I don't care how great they are, when they start breaking down, the body start breaking down, and they will break down, because they they you can call them superheroes right now, but their bodies will break down. And when they break down, guess what they do? Thank you for your service. We now we gotta get somebody else to come on in. But I want to tell you something, God never throws us away. He never throws us away, my friend. I don't care how young you are. I don't care where you are. I don't care how old you are. He will never throw you away. Amen. Because he values you. He values you because he knows that you are worth saving. You are worth keeping. Nehemiah got the job done. 
He built all the walls. And then he turns Jerusalem back to the king and all the people. And then he earns their respect. But it wasn't long after that that he returned back to exile in Babylon and found out that there was morality and corruption that was taking place again. And it broke his heart. But he returns back and tells them and puts things back in order. Guess what Nehemiah becomes, though? Can you imagine coming from a little cupbearer to the governor? You don't know where God is going to put you. You don't know what the Lord is going to do in your life. But I'm going to tell you something. Folks, you can't do it with a spirit of fear. You can't do it with a spirit of saying, I, I don't know, I don't know. No, you got to know. Listen, don't second guess Jesus. Amen? Don't, don't second guess his, his grace and his mercy. When you come to the Lord, you have to come through faith. You have to say, I believe that he is the son of the living God. I believe he can save my soul. And how does he do that? For me just coming and accepting him and confessing that I am a sinner. I believe that Nehemiah knew how to pray. Not only did he know how to pray, but Nehemiah knew how to get a hold of God. Imagine this. God places a Jew with a Gentile. And they form a bond. And now he has favor. This Jewish Nehemiah has favor with a Gentile king. And he gives him everything he wants. Don't tell me that there isn't a God, folks. Don't tell me there isn't a God. I've, I've been in places where I've had favor. I, I, listen, I met some pastors this week. They are new pastors in the city of San Francisco. They have to come through me to get credential. I got a call from the district. They asked me to come and go and see these people. I spoke to them and gave, asked them a bunch of questions, filled out some paperwork. And the, the nicest people in the world, they said, Pastor, we're, we're in a quandrum. We, we need to get this, this paperwork and credentials done. Immediately, these people won favor with me. They really did. I, I just liked them. The moment I saw them, we went out, we broke bread. They, they're great people. They were from Malaysia. They had been in a church in, uh, in Malaysia for 15 years. Then they went to Canada, started and planted churches there for 20 years. And now they're in San Francisco, and they have taken over a church down in, uh, in, in the middle town of San Francisco. And I, 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 just, I just loved them. And they told me, you're the first pastor that we have spoken to. I said, I didn't even know you were here. Had I known you were here, I would have came to see you. And we sat there and we broke bread and we talked for two hours. I came back, I filled out all the paperwork, got a hold of the district, sent that in. I said, we need to expedite this immediately for their credentials. They already have credentials, but in another country. All they got to do is transfer their credentials over. How do we do that? You win favor with people, folks, and it's going to, you know what's going to happen? It's going to happen with your attitude got to happen with your attitude. You know what I've learned to do now? When I'm talking business on the phone, I'm, and, and I've heard this on many occasions, not for a manipulating tactic, but I do it intentionally. I smile on the phone when I'm talking because I've had people to tell me I can sense your smile on the phone, but I've never seen you. First thing I start asking people now, you have to be intentional, folks. Even when you come before God, you have to be intentional. Here's what I've done to people now when I ask them on the phone. I said, well, how are you doing? How was your day? They said, well, I'm, do you really want to know the truth? I said, that's why I asked. Yes, I want to know the truth. Actually, I'm not doing too good. Can I pray for you? See, it opens up all types of doors, folks. But, but see, we are so caught up in our stuff that we don't realize that God is working through us and in us and for us to help somebody else while we are helping ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't ever get come into the despair that God is not in control of the situation. We must maintain an attitude of hope that would transform into an attitude of expectation. The only way we're going to do that is change our mindset 
as we trust in the word of God. Here's a man who started off in exile in Babylon from Jerusalem and ends up from a cupbearer to the king to the governor. Why? Don't tell me that Jesus won't involve in that, the Holy Spirit. Now he's over all that region. Don't tell me there isn't a God, folks. Don't tell me that God ain't looking out for your best interest. But you got to do some work. You got to clean up your act. You know, you got to do some stuff too. You can't just sit back and say, oh, I'm just going to wait until it happens. No, it don't work that way. You, you got you to get your feet wet. You got to take, take some chances. You must siege the opportunity. I think Nehemiah seized the opportunity. We, you know what, can I say this right here? We are some of the laziest people on the face of this earth and got everything at the palm of our hand. We really are. And I'm not, I'm, I'm, I've, I've observed it. Other people come from different countries. Listen, they, get, they see opportunity and they say, and we should never get mad with them. We should never get angry with them. We have an opportunity to read this word and pray every single day. And you know what we say? I just don't have the time. And other, I, when I talked to these people, they were telling me in Singapore, that kids are all over the world now. Singapore, Malaysia, and Canada, and they all have churches and whatnot. You know what they told me? It's not unusual for, uh, for every church in, in different countries like that to have five to 10,000 people in the congregation. Why? Because they're hungry for God. They, they seize the opportunity. Folks, let me tell you something. Let's not get lazy in the word. Let's not get lazy in prayer. Let's seek him first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things should be added unto us. Let's hear from God, amen? Let's begin to hear from God. The only way we can hear from God is to talk with God. Did you know that? Listen, you can't form a relationship if you're not communicating. How are you going to get to know your children and your mom and dad unless you communicate with them? How are you going to get to know friends and form a bond with anybody unless you're talking to them? How in the world did Nehemiah get to know the king so well? Besides, his, how did he get into the position as a cupbearer? Somebody must have told him he's a good servant. You want to be a great leader? Learn to be a good follower. Did you hear what I said? You want to be a great leader? Learn to be a good follower. Be a good follower on your jobs, the responsibilities that God has given you. Don't fight with the bosses. Pray for them. Amen? Amen. Stay in the house of God. Seek the face of God. You know, I, I don't know where you stand this morning, but I do know one thing. The God that we serve, he hasn't pushed you by the wayside. He sees you. The eyes of the Lord is in every place, beholding even the good. He said, I'm able to do the exceedingly abundantly. Above all that we ask, I think, according to the power that work within us. You know what else he said? He said, listen, now Paul said this right here. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Don't be ashamed of the person of Jesus Christ, your Savior, your Redeemer. Amen? Amen. 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 Would you stand with me this morning? Thank you for being a part of this service here and joining us this morning, hoping that you will have a wonderful weekend the rest of this couple of days or so and may the Lord bless you and your family be a part of this service here we start at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings and we look forward to seeing you in the future God bless you until we see you again in Jesus name amen bless you